So I'm really glad you're here. I'm super happy to be here because we're going to talk about one of my favorite things, and that's culture. Culture used to be, well, something you might want to look at if you had extra time to make your restaurant a little bit better. So let's say you had a house, you had a great house in a nice neighborhood, and you're super happy with your house, and then one day you thought, hey, I'm going to plant some flowers. My house is going to look a lot nicer. That was culture maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago. Something that you didn't have to have, but if you did have it, it was going to make things prettier and easier. OK, let's fast forward to today. And now, culture is not the flowers at your house. Culture is the foundation of your house. Does anybody know why culture is the foundation of your house today and not just the pretty flowers? The reason for that is the guest has a lot of choices, and the guest can feel the vibe of your organization when they walk in the door. And your employees, boy, do your employees have a lot of choices now where they can work. And we all know what's changing with the workforce and how hard it is to find people. And that's why TRAEF has 25,000 high school students in culinary and management programs around the state. We know how hard it is to find people, enroll them, keep them. Now we've not only got to market to our guests, we've got to market to our employees and what our employees choose. A lot of times they choose how they feel about the employer, and that's the culture. So we're going to do an exercise today. If you don't already happen to find your culture, we're going to do an exercise today to get you started on that process. And I'm really pleased to see some friendly faces in the audience that I have done this with in their businesses. And I hope you don't mind me putting you on the spot, but there's Mark Bailey, something he and Jonathan, his partner, who's probably going to walk in at some point, worked on maybe about seven or eight years ago. And that is the easiest way. You've got two words. You've got associates first. Associates first. That's the culture of OPHDFW. That really dictates a lot of behavior. Culture dictates behavior. That is why you want to talk about your culture. And my friend Estella Martinez, who got inducted into the Hall of Honor the other night. Let me see if I've got this right, because it's been a little while to serve and preserve the Martinez family tradition of excellence. Right? OK. So boy, when you get handed that, when you get handed that, when you go to work in one of Estella's restaurants, you're pretty clear on what your behavior is. Right? And I remember it, and we haven't worked on it in six or seven years. So if I can remember it, I will guarantee Estella's employees can remember it when they come to work every day. Super important. They know what to do. And Mr. Terry Black's joining us today. And I'm in, currently engaged with his group. And we've just gone through this process in his organization. We haven't rolled it out yet. But we're summarizing his organization's culture as, oh, hang on. <laughs> it's the, it's uh, foster, cultivate the quintessential Texas barbecue experience. Right? See, we don't know it yet. It's brand new. So you need something like this in your business. You cannot expect to succeed today in the restaurant business or any business without something like Associates First to serve and preserve the Martinez family of excellence, cultivate the quintessential Texas barbecue experience. Because without that, your people don't know where to go. They don't know what to do. They don't have something consistent, easy to repeat, that you can work with them on every day and get the behavior that you want in order to get the guests you want to walk in the door and stay and the employees you want to join you for a long time and love it. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to walk you through an exercise on how to begin the groundwork for that. So what's culture worth? What, you know, everything we do in business has to have, has to be connected to some numbers. And oftentimes people get lost on culture when you try to connect it to numbers. But if you know me, you know we got to connect it to something. And I have a, an operator, very successful operator, uh, fast growth company that I was working on this uh, a few years ago and we had this great plan to institutionalize this culture and the reason was he was starting to go out of state and his biggest fear is a fear that many of us have. He was going to get off the plane one day, he was going to go to one of his units and it wasn't going to feel like what it's supposed to feel like. So that's everybody's fear as they get bigger. If it doesn't feel like what it's supposed to feel like, what do you do? So we had to figure out how to institutionalize the culture. So I said to him, hey, what do you think this is worth to you financially? Because we've got to have a financial goal 
Uh, does anybody know what he said? Can you guess? He said, I don't know. That's not, maybe he said more, I don't know. So we kept working on it. And we kept working. We said, well, you know, we know culture, culture motivates the guest. We know culture motivates the, the employees. So finally, he came up with a number. It was 30% of revenue was culture. If the culture went away, he realized his guests would stop coming and his employees would stop working. So what we figured out was the culture was responsible, only responsible for 100% of profits. And that was a real eye-opener for us. Because if you, for those of you that have defined your culture or those of you who are going to define your culture today, what you either know or you don't know is culture is your business today. Um, you're not in the restaurant business, you're in the branding business, and the only way to build your brand and attract guests and employees is to have a fantastic culture. So we're going to walk through the process that I use with people like Estella and people like Mark and people like Terry to uh, figure out what your culture is, uh, what you want it to be, where the gap is, and how to get what you want. We're going to be on the express train here. We don't usually do this in 75 minutes, but that's what we got today. So who, who think, can think of a company that is um, strong in culture? It doesn't have to be a restaurant company. A company you do business with maybe as a consumer. Maybe you bought their stock because you like them a lot. Who's got an example of a company that's got awesome culture? Yes. Southwest Airlines. Bam. Usually they're one of the first things I hear, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Wow. I should give you five dollars for that one. I needed that. Who's got another one? Aaron. H-E-B. H-E-B. Great. What do you like about H-E-B? Everything. Well, you can't beat that. We got a few. They're good Fort Worth and uh, yeah, they're coming. Yeah, they're coming. Mark. Whole Foods. Yeah, culture. Yes. Chick-fil-A. Absolutely. Chick-fil-A. Pardon me? Amazon. Wow. Tell me about Amazon's culture. I'm really glad it's Prime Day, so I'm really glad you stopped shopping and you came out. What you want as quick as they can get. A to Z. Right. Yeah. Very good. Anyone else got one that they think is really good? Okay. Those are very, very examples, very common examples that I hear. That I hear. Um, so let's talk about. Chris, you got me? What am I doing wrong? I'm, we got a technical, hang on. Let me get some help here from Chris on the slides. Yep. Well, okay, I'll keep talking while we do that. Uh, we have a new fresh set of handouts, so raise your hand if you didn't get one the first time. Hopefully we've got enough. If not, we'll make more. <coughs> Adam, have you got more coming? Yes. Okay. We're making this. The line's backed up. We're catching up as fast as we can. Well, we're restaurant people. We're not office people. What can I tell you? That's right. It'll make it even better when you get it. So while we're working on the PowerPoint, um, you know, when we're working, we, we think we're working on the important things. We think we're working on our menu and our marketing and our P&Ls. But really, there's nothing more important than culture. And that's the reason why we're all here to talk about it. We've really got to understand how important it is. Um, OK, so I'm kind of stuck without my slides. But I can, guess I can do without it. So there's three things I want you to never hear yourself say. I want you to never hear yourself say, uh, I am the culture. Hey, you want to work on culture? I don't need to work on culture. I am the culture. Don't ever allow yourself to say that. Uh, this a gentleman said that to me about three or four years ago, who will remain nameless, who really, well, we did great together with his company. But he decided he was the culture. And he took the culture piece out of the program that we had developed to build his company out from four to 12 units because he was the culture. OK, so excuse me, so what happened? 18 months later, he's complaining to me because the culture is deteriorating. Because when you say, I am the culture, and your company starts to grow, uh, well, 
at some point, it just you can't touch enough people to, to keep it going. So there are people that think, I, don't, I got this handled, it's me. And if you have one or two restaurants, that's fine. If you have more, your culture is going to go away without a program like the one we're talking about. So never allow yourself to say, I am the culture. Never allow yourself to say you don't have a culture. Because you have a culture, whether it's intentional or not. Some people are like, culture? I don't, I don't know if I really have a culture. Well, you've got it. You may not know what it is. It may not be intentional. But it's very important to uh, understand what you've got. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. And the third thing is I don't care about culture. Boy, I don't know. That's, you don't hear that much anymore. I do hear the I am the culture. Uh, a little bit more, but you've got, I cannot tell you too much. If I do one thing for you today, I have you walk out of this room understanding how important that is. Uh, super important. Chris, how are we coming on the PowerPoint? Hang on a second. Let's get that queued up because I want to talk about the Amazons. I want to talk about the Southwest, the HEBs. We can learn a lot from these organizations. There's four that I hear a lot about when we do this. So uh, we should get this loaded up in just a second. And Chris, if you go to slide four, that's where I am right now. There you go. Four. Okay. Uh, these are uh, four of the most common answers I get when I do this. They change over time, but these are four. And these are organizations that anybody can relate to. We really understand. Uh, we know why if we do business with them. And I want your restaurant to be like them in as much as you have highly identifiable culture that people are excited about. So let's talk about, let's talk about Southwest Airlines. Who said that first? Right. What is it that you love about Southwest Airlines? Always friendly. Always friendly. They're always friendly. They make you feel like they care about you. They're having fun. Sometimes you get on other airlines and they're trying to have fun like Southwest. Has that, notice that doesn't work out too well? It's just really forced or awkward. Uh, and look at Southwest. Southwest started flying from here to Dallas, right? That's all they did. I think it was $15 or $25 when it started. And now it is the largest airline by passengers growth in the United States, number one. Now, what does Southwest say? Southwest says they have three things they focus on in their culture, appreciation, recognition, and celebration. If you go into Southwest organization, that's what you find out they're doing, appreciation, recognition, and celebration. And you can see how those three words connect to everything that you really love about Southwest Airlines. So that's super good. Um, REI. REI is a highly defined brand. It's unique. It's, uh, it's a co-op, which is kind of out there for retail. And their people are really, really into what they do. At REI, they, their, their slogan is, employees give life to our purpose. So, so they're an employee's first company, like Mark's company. Employees give life to our purpose. And how do they do that with their employees? What do they do? Well, they do things like, if you work there, uh, they have a challenge grant. If you can create the most crazy, wild adventure that you need a lot of REI gear in order to do, then you go right to the top and you get awards and recognition for doing that. They have town hall meetings with all their employees around the company. So REI, when you walk into one of their stores, you're feeling the benefit of what REI can do. And you need to feel that, you know, I don't like to tell anybody what they need to do if you know me well, but this is serious. This is what you want in your restaurant. Uh, Trader Joe's, we heard Whole Foods, which is a whole other story, you know, and a Texas story. Trader Joe's is another really interesting, um, very interesting culture. They, they do things their own way. You know, Trader Joe's said, well, in a, in a, at a time when delivery is a huge next step in retail, Trader Joe's says, well, it's not really our thing. We're not going to deliver. You're going to have to come to us. <coughs> at a time where brand diversity is a huge thing, in retail, Trader Joe's says, well, we're only going to stock our own products. And you would think that would be a recipe for a business that was going like this. But instead, it's going like this. So what's special about Trader Joe's? What's special about Trader Joe's, you may not know this, but when you think about it, if you go into the store, the, you notice that people are really engaged with you. They seem like they know what's going on out of proportion to a typical grocery store. 
Trader Joe's has a very, very flat organization. It's management and employee. And the employees have a tremendous amount of autonomy on how they do things in each store. <coughs> Excuse me. So Trader Joe's really works on that flat organization, and they're all about collaboration and autonomy. Uh, uh, no, I don't think so. Maybe in the future. Maybe you know something we don't. Maybe we got to go. Maybe that's a stock tip. I don't know. Um, Warby Parker is kind of new on this list because Warby Parker, you know, maybe five years ago, not a lot of people knew what Warby Parker was. It was a website. Now it's a retail store. They are. They have a very, very interesting culture, and it's about teamwork more than anything else. <coughs> you have to excuse me. It's allergy season in Texas. It's about teamwork. And at Warby Parker, who cleans up the store? Everybody cleans up the store at the end of the day. The managers clean up the store at the end of the day. At Warby Parker, they have something called lunch roulette in those stores. It's kind of crazy. Anybody guess what lunch roulette is? Uh, they pick, uh, they, have a, they have a random drawing that for four people that work in each store or in the office that don't even know each other that have to go to lunch together. So you, don't, so you get to meet your coworkers on your lunch break by being assigned. They do a lot of events. They do a lot of education. Their corporate people have to work in the stores so many hours a year. Warby Parker has a very, very neat, neat, innovative culture, and it's a super hot brand, not the least of which they found out how to bring you quality eyewear at, without you know, having to get a mortgage. So these are companies that we talk about we heard some other ones, Whole Foods, Amazon, HEB. And it may sound crazy for me to ask you to make your restaurant company like these companies, right? But really, when you think about it, you've got a lot more control over your organization than a company of these size. You've got a tremendous amount of control over what you do. So we're going to walk through how to control it. Now that I'm back up at PowerPoint, let me figure out where we were. So an example of a culture statement that I did this year for a, and my, my uh, lining kind of fell out on the translation on the memory stick, so try and read it. Uh, this, is an, an, uh, this is something I did for a 30 unit franchisee last year that's just rolling out in Texas. Their three words were going to be respect, quality, and service. That's what they wanted their company to stand for. And uh, they broke that down to uh, respect how we treat and speak to our guests each other, our franchisor, and our vendors. Quality, quality menu items, quality relationships, quality facilities, and service. We're here to serve our guests, our managers, our servant leaders. So you notice with each of these words, respect, quality, and service, we found a number of meanings for them. Just like it's kind of wild to think Southwest can boil it all down to appreciation, recognition, and celebration. So that's really your challenge. How do you boil it down to a few words uh, where uh, you, can do, you can do the whole thing? When, uh, I did another one last year. Oh, lost myself. Uh, committed, compassionate, confident. Three Cs. So this is the kind of thing you're going for. So how do you get there? It sounds good. This is the... The process, it's a four-step process. Identify. The first thing we want you to do is identify what your culture is now. Remember, I don't have a culture. Even the people that say they don't have a culture, they've got a culture. They can sit down and figure out what that culture stands for. The next step is aspire. Aspire, it's aspirational. It's what you want your culture to be. Right? And then we're going to talk about the gap between what you identify, and what you aspire to. Once we get that, we document it, and then we roll it out. So if you look at your handout, there is a page, uh, which is handout page three, identify. And what I'd like to invite you to do, if you want to participate in this, is to take a few minutes and answer these questions with a couple of words. Uh, that's going to tell me what your culture is all about. Whether your culture is extremely intentional and you've got it down like Estella and Mark and Terry do, or if you've never thought about culture for a minute in your life, uh, if you want to play along with us, take a minute to write down what is your single biggest focus that contributes to your success, how do you treat your employees, customers, and vendors, 
and what do you contribute to your community, and what is the language you use. The way you talk is very important to culture. So take a minute, jot down a few notes. If there's anyone else wants a handout that doesn't have a handout, ooh, man, this is not good. OK, does anyone else have, have paper? Because these are the questions on the handout. Uh, yeah. So that's not the way we hope to do it. And if you don't have paper, can you borrow paper from somebody? Because use your phone. Yeah, hey, it's modern. Write on your phone. You can, come on. Ernie, get your phone out. <laughs> oh, you're recording. Well, then speak into your phone. I apologize about the handouts. So uh, what's your single biggest focus? How do you treat employees, customers, and vendors? What do you contribute to your community? And what is the language that you use? Take a minute to think about that. We're going to listen to some, some things that you've got. OK, so what is your single biggest focus that contributes to your success? How do you treat your employees, customers, and vendors? What do you contribute to your community? What is the language you use? Who's got something that explains your single biggest, biggest focus of success? Who's got something they wrote down? Terry? Pardon me? Quality, service, cleanliness. Ellie? Teamwork. You're good. You're good. They're all connected. Anybody else? OK. Fresh. fresh. Alfonso's got fresh. Fresh, safe, and experienced. Fresh, safe, and experienced. Experience. All right. Good. Now you're starting to paint a picture for what you want. Anybody else have something they want to talk about? OK. How do you treat your employees, customers, and vendors? How do you treat the people that you interact with? Who's got something on that? Here come the handouts. Woo! OK, if you're missing a handout, Adam's back with a fresh supply. Apologies. How do you treat your employees, customers, and vendors? Who's got something in that category? Ernie? Family, friendly, and loyalty. You know if you walk into Ernie's restaurant in Dallas, you're going to see that. Anybody else got something for how you treat your employees, customers, and vendors? Ellie? Partners. Partners. That's nice. Right. Respect. At Terry's restaurant, they say you don't work for us, you work with us. That's a strong statement. Super strong statement. Anyone else got something on how do you treat your employees, customers, and vendors? OK, let's go on to the next piece. What do you contribute to your community? This is a trick question, by the way. But let's see what you got. What do you contribute to your community? Who's got something on that that they want to share? OK. I'm sorry. A gathering place to build relationships. You figured the question out. Very good. I like that. A lot of people get stuck on that. You think, they say, what kind of charity work do we do? They kind of go off on that tangent. It's not about the charity work you do. <clears throat> it's about the fabric of any community that is created by restaurants that we're all so proud of. I mean, we're a super important part of our culture. Who else has got something on what do you contribute to your community? Ernie, why are you smiling? He's thinking about sales tax, 8.25%. All right, well, I know you, I'm going to come back to that, because you really helped me out on that point. What's that? Jobs. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And the, and the quality of those jobs dictates a lot for the people that work with us and their future. Number four, what is the language that you use? Language is super important. Language. Uh, really, really indicates where your mind is at, how you speak, the words you use. Does anybody have anything for that? Excuse me? Ask, don't tell. Tell me more about that, Bill. Ask, don't tell. Tell me more about that, Bill. 
Right, right. So that also is how you treat people. Nice. Ellie, we say yes. All right. The famous Four Seasons word, you say yes. Yeah, absolutely, Four Seasons. Go to the Four Seasons and try and get them to say no to you. Just try. They will never say no to you. That's their culture. We never say no to a guest. Well, they have a way of doing it, but you still feel good. Uh, anybody else on the language that you use? OK, so by now, you've, you're starting to write a picture of, of the culture that you've got. And I hope you've been real honest about it, because everybody does not have the culture they want when they start this process. They have the culture that they've got, especially the people that have not really been focused on culture lately. The I am the culture people, the I don't care about culture people, the I don't have a culture people. Because the next piece of this is also, is the next page in your handout. The next page is basically the same four questions, <coughs> but it's aspirational. It's what you want your culture to be how you want your people to answer these four questions, something you haven't yet achieved that through this process you can get to. So it's the same four questions again, except this is about how you would like your culture to be. So you've got to be brutally honest with yourself. You know, we have all we have lofty goals and aspirations. At first, we may not be living up to them. So this is an invitation to say, you know, this is what I would like to be able to say on these four items. I just can't say it yet because I haven't done the work. Or I can't say it now because I haven't directed my people to behave this way. So take a minute to think about what you aspire to culturally and what you want to be able to come back here next year and say, hey, we did it. This is what it's like now. Just take a couple minutes on that, and then we'll see what we come up with. So what are the things you'd like to be able to say about your culture that you can't say yet? Let's take another minute to think about what are the pieces of your culture that you haven't installed yet in your operation, something that's coming. And then we'll talk about them. I see a few people writing. Adrian's hard at it. Let's see what we got. OK, who's got a piece that they want to talk about? Aspirational, you're trying to get there, or you realize you would be advantageous if you could get there? Haven't gotten there yet. <coughs> Excuse me. Who's got something that they're willing to share? Bill. OK, that's a really, really, I'm really glad you brought that up. He wants a relaxed attitude, but he doesn't want his staff to be relaxed on a Friday lunch. So he's got this idea that it's a good piece of your culture to have a relaxed nature in your restaurants. That's a word you're attracted to, right? But you don't want it to undermine you, right? Sorry, boss. I'm relaxed. I blew that table off. OK. <coughs> Who can help Bill with that? 
What's that? Comfy. Comfy. You can only be comfortable with everything is in the right place. Okay. So, so Mars is saying maybe comfortable would be an alternative to relaxed. Anyone else have a thought about that? I think, Bill, I think you're on to something. But it's also about the, the meaning you attach to the words, right? Now, you can provide fantastic service and still be relaxed about it. Can't you? You don't think so. Where's my dictionary? Who's got my dictionary? It's in the phone. Ellie's saying it goes back to training. I think you can train relaxed without forgiving incompetence or urgency. I mean, relaxed is a way of life. You can be relaxed or you can be anxious. You can still provide great service. So I would, uh, I would say you've got a little work to do on getting there, but you, you're, not, you're not at a stopping point. You can still use relaxed if you elaborate on it. And I think because it's an important word to you, I suggest that you work on that. I think that would be good. Who else had something that they aspire to they haven't gotten to yet in their organization that they really want to add? Boy, you guys have all got it worked out, don't you? Nobody's got a thing. Adrian, can I put you on the spot? Okay, so Adrian's talking about good, consistent, creative food, and you think you've got to work on that more. Creativity. The creativity part. So he's identified to have the experience he wants to have in his culture. We've got to step up our creative capability. Good. Well, that's good. Dictates behavior. Aaron. Uh, more okay. More ac a culture of more accountability among standards amongst the team. This is good. Now we're getting some things. Alfonso. Ownership. Ownership. Tell me what that means to you. Employees. <coughs> Okay. So employees take responsibility for making the business successful. This is really good stuff. And really good. If you don't have anything, if, I know we're putting you on the spot. When you reflect on this, when you go back to the hotel, you go back home, you're going to start coming up with some things, some things that will make your organization better. And when we start this process, it's the perfect time to figure out where we want to strengthen the organization so that we can get the behavior right. Your culture statement. It's not something you're coming back to you know, every six months or every year to change. If your culture statement is effective, it's going to be around for a long time. So we really want you to put a lot of thought into it. Who else has something on the aspirational piece they really want to add to their organization? Mars has communication. So what would be the benefit for you of communication being better? Okay. I'm going to get the... I'm going to go to the... Uh, Get this going now that we're getting some longer comments. Morris, why don't you say that again? What's the advantage in your organization of better communication? Is it on? Chris? Chris, have you got that mic on? Are we on? Yep. Yeah. So we could do a much better job of communicating of communicating our brand to our customers and our story to our customers. And then internally, we can also do a better job of communicating to our staff how they make the business a success and how they perpetuate that success. And what would be the benefit of that? What's the outcome? The outcome for me is more touch, more contact with the customers. Right. And then internally, if everybody understands how the business ticks, then ideally we can start ticking more efficiently. Right. Thank you. The outcome is your guests eat in your restaurant more often and your revenue goes up. Anybody against that? Alfonso, your employees take more ownership? Tell us more about that. 
I try to entitle my employees that they have ownership in the business because they, I'm letting them know that it's their responsibility right. when a uh, uh, person comes into the business for, for them to, um, to have a share on, on the job they do, which I do. Uh, they are no owners, but they get a share of, of doing a good job. Right. And, that, and that, for me, is creating a accountability on their end to make sure that everything is done right as we want it to be. And what's the outcome of that? I have a, <laughs> say, uh, I have a saying with my employees that I told them, you treat people that come here the way you want to be treated when right. you go to a business. Right. So the outcome is, is a uh, good experience. Better experience. That you feel at home and in family and treated well. Thank you. Better experiences equals more frequent visits from your guests. Estella. Hospitality. Hospitality. You're working on better hospitality. Yes. Tell us. Well, a prime example is, you know, each server has their <coughs> section. But what about a table that you go by and doesn't have tea or they've run out of chips? We tell our servers and bussers that every table is their table. Right. You know, um, because we don't want our guests to suffer from lack of anything. Okay. Very good. So that's part of the tradition of excellence, right? What's the benefit of that? Well, we want to continue, and the goal is to reach excellence. It is a journey, right. and it takes everyone, as um, Alfonso said, to buy into the philosophy, to buy into the mission statement, to make it their own. So I occasionally, if I see a new face, I said, tell me what the mission statement is. Why are you here? And so we make it a point that everyone learn it, and I'll, I'll say to them, it's 10 simple words, but so hard to accomplish. Right. You have to work on it every day. Thanks. And what you're seeing is uh, people that really have their culture down still need to work on it. It never ends. It's very important. Adrian, if, you're, if your creativity and your organization is better, what happens? What does it look like and what happens? Oh, I have more repeat visits. Oh, yeah. More He's surprises. smiling if you yeah. can't see him. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Aaron, what did you have? You had a good one. Accountability. What does accountability look like and what does it do for you? I mean, I think in general, sometimes you see employees walk past stuff and that's real disappointing uh, for me. And, you know, if they see something that's leaving the window that's not up to our standard, then don't send it out to the guest. Uh, right. So holding each other accountable uh, leads to a better experience, to more frequency and more sales. Okay, great. Thank you. So you're hearing a common theme. People that are successful, people that have their culture down and established, they're still working on it. They still want to get better. And don't sell this short. Uh, if you have a great cultural experience in your organization, if you answer these four questions, these aspirational questions, and you realize there are things that you could do better that would really make a difference for your organization, for its ability to grow, for its ability to attract employees and guests, do not sell that short. That's super important. Uh, and when you start with your culture definition, don't be afraid to reach. Don't be afraid to reach. She's, she's, what Stella did is a really good example of that. She's able to tie back these new observations, right? Everyone's got a station. What about the people that pass a table that needs help that's not their table? She was able to tie back to those 10 words that she's been living on for all these years. So you don't want to be changing your culture statement all the time. You want it to study something that really, really lasts. But what you'll find is as you dig deeper and deeper and deeper, there's more uh, extensions of that culture, subheadings, new things that you can do that you can tie back to the original culture. The last thing you want to do is walk in and go, hey, we changed the culture. Heads will spin. You've got to stick with the, long, the same thing for the wrong, long time, but you can tie these other elements into it. Alfonso. Right. Transfer to a 
bunch of kids. That's coming up. I'm glad you're here. Man, you got about 10 more minutes for me? Okay. How do you get all this transferred to the people that work for you? We're almost. Uh, Okay, so Alfonso gets upset if he walks past a table and he sees a dirty napkin. Anybody else guilty of this problem? Uh, yeah, I know, I got it. We're working on it every day. Okay, so now you've got uh, what you've identified and what you aspire to, and I want to talk about the, one of the most important things that you can ever understand about culture. Uh, don't kill the culture. Uh, you know, we had a slogan in my house when my daughter was born, it was don't burn the baby. And don't burn the baby, it was keep her away from the oven and the burners. And he knows the baby, so that's why he's laughing. Uh, let's try and get her to grow up without you know, any burn marks, stay away from the hot plates. Uh, we felt like we were successful if we could get her through life. And, don't burn. and by the way, uh, this baby is now seven and she made avocado toast for me the other day. And there weren't a lot of burners involved, but she did really good. So uh, my parallel uh, story for culture is don't kill the culture. It is so easy. Like any relationship, you can have a, a long-standing relationship and with one bad day, you know how you can really hurt that relationship. One bad day, say the wrong thing one time and you're going to really have to dig out from that and your people are going to feel it and they're going to hold that grudge. You've got to be so careful that you're living your culture once you establish it. If you stand up in front of your team, whether your team's 30 or 3,000, and say, here's how we're going to do it, and you do not model that behavior, or you have one bad day, uh, it's over. You're going to have a lot of rebuilding to do. So you don't kill the culture. I was talking to a guy yesterday who runs, he's an uh, operations director, he's got about 13 units, and he's a totally inspirational leader. And when I meet inspirational leaders, I love to ask them how they fire people. Because how do you, how do you fire people and stay inspirational, right? Uh, how do you do that? Now, some people know how to do that. And he did. He had a really good story for me about uh, how when he lets somebody go, he talks to them about how they, they are better than this and they can do better and they're going to have a great career. It's just that they violated the terms of the rules in this restaurant. So the person left being inspired. He says, I never scream, I never raise my voice, I never curse. Okay? Well, you can't walk around saying I'm an inspirational leader if you scream, raise your voice, and curse. Well, you can, just you don't have any credibility. So don't kill the culture reminds us, all of us that are in leadership that we have to live it every day. We can't cut corners, and we can undermine all this work with one bad day. So let's see, let's see what's next. Okay. This is something, this is a very simple table. For, the, for those of you that there's a gap between the culture that you have and the culture you want, it kind of is a way to summarize it for yourself to get you a visual uh, of where we need to close the gap. Not only how we need to educate our teams about how to close the gap, but how we need to educate ourselves about how to close the gap. So this is nothing that you have to do right now, but it's something you can really, it's kind of a worksheet for understanding how to get from what you've identified to what you've aspired to. But I would like you to do this. This is kind of a good one. This is about alignment. Uh, what's the last major decision you made in your company and did it align with culture? What's the difference between what you've identified and what you aspire to? Where's the gap? And then you'll see this is on the next page in your handout. It's a simple score, 1 to 10. The person that has a, a one is really totally out of whack between what they have and what they want. And the rare person that's at number 10 is completely aligned. So take a minute to think about these, and we're going to talk about them. And then, Alfonso, the answer to your question is coming up.
Okay, so let's put our thoughts down about this and give us a 1 to 10. And uh, we're going to talk about it in one more minute. I can't tell if you're working on your phones or if you're on Facebook. <laughs> a recent decision they made in their company, a big decision. Okay, who has got a recent decision they made in their company, a big decision, and can talk about how it aligned with their culture? Who's got that? Oh, over here. Christopher. Uh, the one that we have is we took the radio out of the kitchen, the loud, obnoxious music. Okay, so how did that fit in culturally? The music was not, you know, the, the loud music, them not listening, people that, you know, just wasn't appropriate for other people, you know, uh, listening to rap music, that kind of, you know, right. um, it, it just wasn't fitting in with our culture and, you know, taking that out alleviated that problem we're having of focus, 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 focus is better. Thank you. Who else has got a recent big decision they made that's consistent or inconsistent with their culture? Anybody else? Anybody else made big decisions lately? Or is this a group that's trying to avoid big decisions? Anybody else got one? Adrian? Oh, uh, we closed for Easter. Closed for Easter. Mm -hmm. How was that culturally consistent? Um, well, it was just uh, us continuing. It was a real benefit for the employees that right. had families. And okay. so it was just, uh, it emphasized family. Right. Yeah, and that's a, that's a tough one for a lot of us. More and more of us are open on Thanksgiving and Christmas. Yeah. Uh, yet. Yeah. And it's, yet. Yeah, especially coming from a guy that's single with no kids and, hey, yeah, let's stay open. I don't see the problem. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a lot of people closed on July 4th for their, for their employees. That was a cultural decision. Who else has a major decision they've made lately that they can talk uh, about how it dovetails with their culture? Or is that as as much as you're willing to tell us about your major decisions. Alfonso? Change of service type would be a major decision. Change of service type would be a major, I would say they don't get much bigger than that. What did you change from to? I got rid of the servers. <laughs> Can you say that in a more culturally appropriate way, please? Okay. Do you remember the don't kill the culture <laughs> thing, man? It was five minutes ago. Um, I made a decision to actually, and we're still uh, going through testing, and actually it's been taken by customers uh, really good, but the, uh, the deal was to get rid of uh, servers and waitresses. Okay. Service, but we, we actually shift the service to a different group of people, and it's working for us. Okay, so you went from full service to fast casual? Yes, sir. So changing service time for the guest. It, when, when the part at the end, that's the payoff. It's working better for the guest. I mean, I've changed full service to fast casual. I've changed fast casual to full service, different restaurants. It's about what's good for the guest. That's the cultural piece. That's the cultural piece. <coughs> Who else has got a major decision they made? Patty. We are in the Austin area and decided to open in Dallas. It's a totally different place. And uh, the big decision we made was hiring you to help <laughs> us carry over that culture because <laughs> we're needing to carry that same thing over but with a different clientele. Yeah, thanks, Patty. Thanks for the plug. Appreciate it. And that's the process that I talked about earlier. The reason that Terry's organization defined the culture is because he's opening a unit 200 miles away from his home. Uh, and uh, he doesn't want to walk in, like the fellow I talked to you about it before. Terry and his sons don't want to walk into that unit and go, this doesn't feel like Terry Black's. So that's a real important thing for all of you. Okay, so if you did the scale of one to 10, who was above five on alignment? <coughs> Come on, we've got some small hands going up. Nobody above five. Wow, we got, some, we got to come back here next week, do some more. No, we have one person above five. Wow, I want you to talk about how you got to be, how you got to be above five. Here you go, here you go, Matthew. I'm actually not a restaurant business. I'm, a, okay. I'm, an, I'm, I'm an architect uh, okay. who designs restaurants. So, and we're a pretty small team. Uh, we've got a, a six-person team. 
uh, in-house. Of course, we've got our consultants, MEP engineers, food service consultants, and people who work outside with us, you know, in, uh, structural, those guys. And uh, uh, we've been, a, been around for 14 years, uh, sure. so I think pretty well established um, on what our goals and culture are, although I, this is definitely eye-opening. We need to write these things down. You know, my, um, what, uh, I, I don't know. Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. I'm putting you on the spot. I have the microphone <laughs> flies or something. Like this. But um, the, um, you know, I think we've got a ways to go, but I think the, uh, it's, I guess it's hard to talk about this without talking about, you know, what, it, what I think our, um, I wrote down that our, the big, the biggest uh, focus that contributes to our success is I think our, our attention to detail, our thoroughness, our accuracy, you know, right. our, our due diligence on, on the front end, you know, the way, we, um, and then how do we treat our employees and customers, you know, kindly, with respect, empathy, and, and work in a collaborative manner. Um, and it's interesting because on the question about what do you contribute to the community, my answer was kind of similar. You know, we create experiences in the dining environments that we create, and I wrote down what I forget who else was said that you know gathering place to build relationships because that's really how we view our role in the development of our clients' restaurants is to create a unique a brand appropriate experience um, what are, that um, you know we use uh, our experience to create a, I wrote this down to create a unique and appropriate dining or customer experience that's specific to, to our client's brand, making the entire process a positive experience, you know, for the client. Right. And then we gain more experience in that process and go back and do it again. And Fantastic. So, so, so you've got a lot of good things going on. So. You've got to refine it. I don't, I don't know if I answered your question. I think you did. I think you could hear a lot of good material there and a lot of confidence that he's at five or better. <coughs> so who kind of looked at that scale of one to 10 and all of a sudden didn't feel so good? They realize they have a lot of work cut out for them. Maybe they're a little more focused now, but they've got a lot of work cut out for them. Who's got that? Who's a little bit lower on the scale? I know nobody wants to talk about that, their problems in a group like this, but uh, I think if you're scoring yourself low, two things to consider. One, you may just be self-critical. A lot of us are. And I, and I would talk to your people in your organization about it. Two, it's really time to get to work on this. If you do not handle this, the world is going to pass you by. There's just going to be more competition. There's going to be fewer employees. And your culture must be handled. I'm giving you some tools to start to handle that today. So let's see what's next here. Uh, once you document it, and documenting is a, is a process that's going to take you a while, <coughs> because you're going to live with what you document for a long time, uh, you want to go back and if you and to find someone in your organization or a resource that can really, really work on getting and writing uh, what you want to happen. Really, really work on the wordsmithing, it, like that example I showed you earlier. Uh, and you got to put a deadline on when you're going to get this done, or you'll never finish it. Just like anything. And then you got to roll it out. You got to launch it, and you got to. And this is the Alfonso question from earlier. <coughs> I'm really glad he brought it up because it's really it's critical. How do you maintain and measure your culture is consistent working and being practiced by all. How does that happen? Um, so let's talk about, we talk about this. I'm going to tell you the biggest secret to making this work. There's one thing that I really want you to remember, and it's always talk about culture first. Always talk about culture first. It's hard to do, man, because we're in the restaurant business and things are happening around us. and we get a sense of urgency, and that urgency is real because it's got to do with our guests. But we have to learn to have the discipline to always talk about culture first. Jonathan, can I tell a story about you and your general managers? From how many years ago? 10 years ago? Man. So 10 years ago, Jonathan and I are sitting in a meeting with all of his general managers, which at the time were maybe six, five, six? And let's, let's go back to what we talked about. Mark was, we talked about, about Mark and Jonathan's company in the beginning. They were an associate's first company. 
uh, and they've been doing this for a long time. And what Jonathan and I noticed was we sit him down and we talk about money because that's what you talk about. What were sales last week? How, who's making bonus? What, who hit their food cost? Okay, that's, that's business. You have to talk about that. And we'd sit him down and talk about that. And then by the time we got to the things that were more important, associates first, they were gone. They were gone in a world of spreadsheets and calculators and budgets. And we couldn't get them back. So right there we went and made a decision. We made a decision that we would start the meetings and talk about culture. In fact, we split up the meetings up for a while into culture and money, just to make our point. <coughs> and that's an example of what I see my most successful clients doing. They start every conversation, whether it's between owners and management, a uh, weekly operations meeting, a pre-shift meeting, uh, an owner conversation. They start by talking about the culture first. And I really want you to let that soak in because the one way, the most important way to make this permeate for people to know you're serious about it is to talk about culture every meeting, every time there's an interaction, talk about it first. And now what we do is, when we do that, we're able to go into a pre-service meeting and ask our servers, well, you don't have servers anymore, so you can't ask them. You can ask your cashiers, what did you do today to uphold our culture? What did you do on your last shift to uphold our culture? We need to create stories. And we create that, we, we take the best stories and we keep them, we save them, and we distribute them, and we make them into folklore. So if I'm looking at one of my associates and I'm asking, what did you do on your last shift to exemplify the culture, and they don't have an answer, I know that I haven't done a good job in educating and creating an expectation level about what I, kind of behavior my culture dictates. If I go to that same next person, they have three stories, and I know I'm doing it right. It's very easy to fool yourself and say, hey, we're this. But, we're, but if, under the microscope, you're not. And that's why I wanted you to contrast what, you'd what your aspirational culture is versus your actual culture. It's very easy to fool yourself. Don't fool yourself. You can't fool your employees. You can't fool your guests. You've got to live your culture every day. And I'm not pretending it's easy. It's a discipline. But it gets easier the more you do it, the easier it becomes like any habit, it becomes a way of life. Alfonso, does that answer your question? When do you start? Tomorrow. Excellent. Alfonso's starting tomorrow. <coughs> I hope you all start tomorrow too. Let's see what's next. So identify, aspire, document, roll out. That's the process. It's very important to go through all those steps and take the care and the depth to do it the right way. Uh, and what you'll find is that's how these cultures grew. That's how these cultures grew. My wish for you is that you can look at your brand and that people start to look at your brand and they start to say some of the things that they say about Southwest and our REI and Trader Joe's and Warby Parker and Amazon and some of the other ones we heard about. Uh, and I'm here to tell you, you've got to do this work. It is not optional in our business anymore. There's too much competition out there. Before we go, we've got some time for thoughts, questions, and answers. Uh, hopefully answers, or at least questions. Anything that we didn't cover today that's on your mind on this topic. I noticed something. If it's just on the tip of your tongue, why don't you just go out there and go crazy and ask it? Or we'll bring it up. Anybody have anything they want to contribute? <coughs> wow, I'm super thorough. Joanne. Oh, Johnny. Okay, let's talk about rollout. <coughs> That's a good question. If you're at the beginning of this journey, how do you roll it out without getting the eye rolls and without getting them thinking, well, they're talking about this now, they don't re they're not really going to live it? Because we've all seen companies that talk about things that they don't live. Well, first of all, I would say you're going to have to live with a little bit of that. You're going to have to prove it to your people that you're going to live the culture. And you, we're going to have to, so 
when you launch this, you're obviously you're going to go through management meetings, you're going to go through staff meetings to introduce this, you're going to have conversations about it, you're going to talk about what behavior falls within the culture, what behavior is, goes out of the culture, you're going to use a lot of examples. You're going to talk about, just like I did, I just gave you the gift of talking about companies that your employees respect on a cultural basis and create that aspirational gap to, to get there. And I think you're going to have to live with some skeptics for a while. So when you see the eye rolls, instead of reacting to it, I would just accept it. But I would pledge to your team that you're serious. You're going to prove to them that this is how you're going to behave, and you're going to expect them to prove to you that they can accept this challenge for better behavior because you have to have a because. You'll hear me saying that. What's the benefit? What did I say to my friend who uh, when we, I, when I talked about an hour ago? He said, well, I'm worried I'm going to walk into my unit and get off the plane, walk into my unit, and it's not going to feel like my unit. Well, we had to tie it to money. We had to tie it to a business goal. It's not just um, altruistic that we want to be good people, even though we do, most of us want to be good people. This is a business. So we tie that to revenue growth, to job security, to unit growth, to higher check averages, to all kinds of good things that happen in companies that have good culture, just like these guys have competitors too. I can guarantee you they're tying their culture to their market share. So the three, the three important steps are accept that you're going to get some eye rolling, challenge your employees to see that you're going to live it, and ask them to live it, and tie it to a business objective. Does that answer your question? Good question, really good question, because we've all seen the eyes roll. Okay, Jeffrey. Let me give you the mic. I'm not very consistent on the mic, but I'm doing my best here. So to add to, to Johnny's note there, what Matthew had coached me years ago on something, I would come back from these trade shows and go to my staff, and they'd go, oh my gosh, Jeffrey just came back from a trade show. And, we got 10 new items we've got to have to deal with. We have a new POS we have to deal with, and we've got all this other, this, this team building stuff we've got to deal with. But what I would do is I would integrate it into my management meetings every month, and I would break it down into smaller chunks. So it became part of the management's culture and part of my consistency in what I'm learning and what I'm taking back from these sessions. So. Uh, it wasn't just dumping it on them and say, hey, guess what? I'm smarter now, and we're going to do all this stuff my way. Uh, so it really was helpful to chunk it down for me and take it off through the year. Thanks, Jeffrey. Appreciate it. Other questions or comments or thoughts? This is your big chance to get this. What, Adrian, what did you say when you came in the door? What did you want to get today? Creativity. Okay, creativity. That's a good one. I'm going to ask you about that in the six months. Anything else? Hey, I really want to thank you for taking the time this morning to think about this for yourself, for being good to yourself, uh, and understanding the benefits of culture. You know, I want, want to know my life's question I wake up and think about every morning is why aren't restaurateurs as good to themselves as they are to their guests? And if you want to be good to yourself, and have a very stable, long-standing, growing company that can withstand competition and can attract employees, culture is going to only become more and more important as we see each other at TRA shows in the coming years. Uh, so I really want to thank you for taking the time, for thinking about the process I showed you, thinking about these examples and how to get the culture in your company closer to a world-class culture like Southwest, REI, Trader Joe's, Warby Parker, and protecting your investment, because that's what we're here for. We're here to protect our assets. We're here to grow the best way we can, create great jobs for people, and let our guests have fantastic experiences all around Texas. So thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of your time at Marketplace. Appreciate it.